Welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Nick Kroger, and today we have a very special guest with us, uh, Lyris Stuber, and I'm going to brag on you just a little bit. Uh, she is a board-certified licensed marriage and family therapist here in the Central Florida area, a master's of science degree, and a bachelor's degree in psychology. So that just says to me, you know lots of things about lots of different topics uh, pertaining to how we could live better. <laughs> Thank you so much for that warm intro introduction, Nick, and I'm excited about being here today. We're, we're glad you're here. We're, we have a couple topics that I think are, are very important and relevant, especially here in the Central Florida area. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is grandparent caregivers, and I guess before we get started, we should uh, have you define, uh, from your viewpoint, what is a grandparent caregiver? Sure, Nick. I would be happy to talk about this topic. And this is something that's near and dear to my heart right. because I had grandparents growing up who were part-time caregivers to me after school. And, then, and now my own children get to benefit from that with my loving parents who are able to care for them after school as well. So grandparent caregivers are grandparents who become caregivers to children due to a variety of reasons. Maybe it's the death of a parent, military service of a parent. Maybe it's due to drug abuse, um, neglect or abuse issues in, in the household. It could be due to also um, financial issues, uh, pregnancy of a teenager, and from any, in any which way in which the primary um, parent is not able to care sufficiently for the needs of the children. Excellent. And, and you do find in today's society for those reasons and, and many more that um, grandparents are having to step in and, and assist in some way. Absolutely. Um, statistically, always good with statistics, statistically, how many children within families are being raised by a grandparent caregiver? Well, believe it or not, 8% of children in the U.S are being cared for by grandparent caregivers part-time and 10% full-time. 2.4 million grandparents are caring for 4.5 million children. Wow. So that is a, 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 quite a number of, of people that are stepping in and helping to give care to their grandchildren. It is, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing, but it also can be um, very exhausting yes, at times. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Typically, uh, we touched on it briefly, but if you can go into just some more depth or examples of responsibilities uh, of, a, of a grandparent caregiver that um, some of our people watching might identify with and, and say, oh, I could do that, or, or that would be great if I had someone who could do that. Sure. Well, some of those responsibilities could be as simple as after-school care for kids um, when they come home helping with homework. And, um, and maybe just you know, getting dinner made and, and, and serving them until the parents are able to pick them up. But many who are the full-time uh, grandparent caregivers have to be basically in the role of the primary parent. That means getting up in the morning, you know, taking care of the kids, whether it be um, infants or school-aged kids, getting them off to school, and all the responsibilities that come with that as far as you know, doctors and medical appointments after school care, running them around from here to here to their teacher teacher conferences right. all that matters being in that role of a parent and um, a lot of times you know grandparents are they're past that stage they've raised their children already and like I said before due to um, unforeseen circumstances they have to now step back into that role I, I, and you see and you hear about it you know so much more um, uh, this day in age um, you know again because of various circumstances I'm interested to know your take being, you know, having the opportunity to have been raised, you know, part time or with grandparents of your own, and now you're seeing the benefit for your children of that. What are some of the things that, that you remember that you value that you probably would have not gotten had they not been involved in helping to raise you? Well, it was a wonderful experience for me as, as a child, and um, I, I experienced a greater respect for the elderly. Um, I remember, you know, um, coming home from school and going to my grandparents' house and my grandfather telling me stories yes. of my father growing up, and they raised 10 children. I'm like, how did you do yes. that? I could barely <laughs> raise two of my right. own. 
and just hearing all the antics and, and their struggles and just getting um, um, a greater respect and love and appreciation for them, their legacy, you know, family values, right. and the work ethic that they instilled in my, my, my father and, and that, um, that translated to me um, as a person just, you know, I want to have that, that in my character, in my legacy. And so just being able to appreciate that, um, those, are, those are some of the, the benefits. Um, other, other things would be just the opportunity to just slow down mm -hmm. and, and not be so fast paced. Um, and to have help with homework after school, that was great. And just being able to just really have um, another deeper uh, level of nurturing that I really appreciated. Yeah, those are things that are, are, are priceless. It is. And have ripple effects, I'm sure, now through you to your children and, and probably beyond that. Mm -hmm. That will be of benefit. Um, what are some of the challenges? I know that's kind of a loaded question, but um, there's some, pro some probably more obvious than others. But what are some of the challenges that face a grandparent who's needing to participate part-time or full-time in caregiving? Well, some of the challenges, Nick, would be, first of all, their health. Um, oftentimes grandparents are over the age of 50 so they have their own health concerns, medical appointments that need to be met and um, just being able to have the energy to keep up with children and, and, not, and having, um, you know, trying to live a healthy lifestyle and be there for their kids and for their grandkids. So health concerns are, are, are one of the primary concerns. The other thing would be isolation. Um, like I said, grandparents, they're done raising their children, right. but now they have to step back into that role. And maybe um, a lot of their peers are not raising grandchildren. So then they feel alone sometimes. What do you do when you have um, a child who's experiencing social, behavioral, or emotional problems, ADHD, um, oppositional defiance, going through depression? Maybe they come from an abuse situation. Right. Where, um, where DCF has had to pull them from their home and now place them with them and they're having PTSD or traumatic issues. Mm -hmm. And so all that is kind of new and how, how do you deal with that and being able to take children to doctor's appointments, therapy appointments, things of that nature and, and step in and just you know, help kids when they're in need. And I would imagine, I'm just thinking as you're talking and sharing information, um, especially those that are in a full-time grandparent situation, you know, helping to raise their grandchildren, um, there would be legal things that, that would need to take place to be able to, you know, uh, deal with their medical issues, um, give them the authority, I guess, that a parent typically would have. I'm assuming it's not just, oh, you're the grandparent, you can do this, um, that people need to think of as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, if, uh, if they have to step into that role um, by, you know, by planning or, or, or by choice, then the parent is oftentimes able to um, give, that, give them the, the responsibility and the ability to do that. They can have a statement notar notarized and giving them permission to make medical decisions and school decisions. But if it comes from a legal standpoint, let's say they were removed from the home, right. then DCF would be the one to give them the authorization to, to do that. Um, to be able to help make medical and legal and mental health decisions for, for those children. And uh, I would imagine we have viewers that are watching that, you know, our grandparents, proudly, you know, sure. grandparents. And um, w what are some key points you could give them, you know, that, you know, like you said, you benefited from some of the stories, from hearing about your father, uh, you know, and the work ethic that was transferred down. Um, they're a wealth of information, but if a grandparent is watching, what are two or three key things that, that they should purpose to pass on to their grandchildren? Well, well one of the things they should um, purpose to pass on would be um, their family values. Yeah. And, and that is something that's important because uh, sometimes there's, there's conflict between the biologi biological parent and the grandparent right. as far as um, the values and, and the morals that the, the children are growing up with. But if, if they can come together and say, okay, these, these are the things I want to pass on to my, to my children. These are the characters that, um, that I want them to want to instill um, in them, to them, for them to become productive members of society. So having some sort of parenting goal Right. Um, even as in the grandparent role. Okay, these are my goals as a grandparent. This is what I'm going to do. These are the values I'm going to teach. This is how I'm going to help, help um, these children to have a better life and to have better outcomes than possibly they, they maybe uh, would not have. 
Also, I want to let them know that, that they're not alone. Right. They may feel alone sometimes um, in this wonderful task, but, um, but, there's, but they're not. And they can get resources um, and support from lots of different places. Um, you can start by uh, maybe going to AARP. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good website um, for to help to to give helpful information to grandparents. Um, there are other ones um, like um, raisingyourgrandkids.com. Interesting. Yes, it's a great website for resources and article as well as my um, floridafamilies.com. They have support groups that grandparents can go to Wonderful. and, and will give you information on, um, on financial information uh, that they can get because they may experience financial hardship too. A lot of these, a lot of these grandparents they may, not have, may not have the financial resources to be able to do right. everything that they need and they can get assistance through the government. Um, you can also go to tollifecounselingcenter.com which is our website and we're able to give you information about uh, about parenting and how to work with your adult child in raising of the children. Excellent and I think resources are so they're invaluable because you're right you don't want to feel like you're on your own or you're uh, charting this course by yourself when others have charted it ahead of you and are alongside you that you could glean information uh, from all these wonderful resources um, and also you know I think you may not realize it in the moment, um, but what a blessing, you know, to that child and unexpected blessing for that grandparent to be able to participate in a way other grandparents would love to have more time with their kids. Well, absolutely. It gives them a sense of purpose because a lot of, um, a lot of seniors, they, re they maybe retire and then, okay, what, what happens next? Right. So it gives them that sense of joy. And my own parents have even said that to me. They, you know, they feel a lot of joy in their hearts right. being able to help and care for um, my children part-time. And I'm thinking, wow, at the end of the day, yeah. you know, <laughs> I'm exhausted yes. if I'm with them, you know, a couple hours in the, in the afternoon, the evening. And, and to hear that is, is definitely a blessing and, yeah. and brings me joy. Yeah, and well beyond the circumstance, it, it will have wonderful ripple effects in, in lives. Um, I want you to stay with us, if you will. We're going to just take a quick break. And viewers, don't go anywhere. I'm going to keep Lyris Stuber here with us, and we're going to talk about another great topic after this short break. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. Welcome back to Join Our Town. I'm your host, Nick Kroger, and as promised, we've kept uh, Lyra Stuber here as a board-certified licensed marriage and family therapist here in the Central Florida area. And Lyra, thank you again so much for being here to talk about a couple topics that I just think are really valuable to our viewers. You're welcome, Nick. I'm so happy to be here. I want to switch gears a little bit um, and, and talk about a topic you hear horrific stories about, you know, maybe the worst cases. Um, but it can become a problem, and it's hoarding. And, and, and the effects, not on the person who is hoarding, but on the entire family. So let's, let's first describe hoarding. What is hoarding? Well, hoarding is the compulsion to acquire, purchase, search for, or save items that have little or no value. And it's become a problem in today's society. Um, and it differs from collecting because collectors often have a sense of pride and accomplishment right. about their collection. It could be um, coins, it could be model cars, it could be figurines or things like this but hoarders have a sense of shame and embarrassment about their habit um, because they're hoarding insignificant things like pieces of paper or mm. plastic or, or, um, or food and it just kind of overwhelms them, overwhelms their house and kind of takes over their lives. It's very interesting to me. I never uh, had heard it put that way. I thought hoarding they're aware to the point where they, they are ashamed of what they do, but yet have the compulsion to continue to do. 
Yes, they are. They they know what they're doing is 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 not okay, um, and it, it's uh, hoarding is related a little bit to anxiety or even obsessive compulsive okay. disorder, because um, they hoard because it gives them a sense of security. This is something I can hang on to, even though it's, it's really insignificant. And so they keep acquiring and acquiring and not getting rid of or purging. And, um, and they know that it's, it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And um, it, like I said, it takes over their space, but they don't know how to stop. OK. That, I, I never quite thought through it to that point, but that's very interesting. Um, so within the family dynamic, for instance, what would be, if you're able, a percentage uh, of those who are hoarders, you know, overall or here in Central Florida? Well, nationally, 2.5% of people can be considered hoarders. Um, the average age of hoarders are, um, is 50. Okay. And so I don't know specifically for Central Florida region. I haven't come across right. that okay. as yet. But, but there's a small percentage, 2 to 5% nationwide um, are hoarders. My goodness. And let me ask you this. When you gave me the average age, you know, then you, my brain immediately goes, okay, well, that's kind of mid-life. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I wonder, are there, is there a connection, you know, with maybe people who are about 50-ish, the transitions that happen maybe with kids being out of the house or about to, do you think sometimes it's associated with a, 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 the need to value, to still feel valuable or to be in control of something in your life? Absolutely, Nick, yes, because often at that stage, you, uh, the children may be leaving or in the process of leaving the household. People may experience the death of a spouse or a family member, and something in their life is out of control, and, and this is their way of kind of controlling something yes. in their life, even though it may look to us as being is insignificant, and, um, but for them, this is their way of kind of hanging on to something. Um, that gives them that sense of security. And as you talk too, I mean, and I told you before we went to air, I learned so much being able to do these shows and meet people such as yourself. Um, and this is one topic that you are shedding great information on, even just to me, um, that sense of control. So immediately I began to think, well, you know, people who suffer from other disorders, mm -hmm. you know, most common you hear anorexia, mm -hmm. you know, that's someone wanting to gain some control in that case of their body, their body. this yeah. instance is somewhat still based in that sense of control. I, I can acquire and I can hold on to, yes. but yet they're aware yes, that they're, it's yeah. not normal. Yeah, they're, they're fully aware of, of what they're doing. And it just, um, it's, it's, it's a ripple effect in the family. It, it, yes. Like I said, beyond that sense of embarrassment and shame, um, they may experience financial hardship. They may be, um, they may be, on the verge of getting evicted from their from their place, their apartment, their house, because mm -hmm. it becomes a health hazard, and um, or, or they may lose their kids, or or you know, right. or over this, and it's just something that they feel that they have to keep doing in order for them to feel secure. That's it's very interesting to look at it from that vantage point. Um, how would you go about as a family member? Um, how would you begin to go about trying to? help someone who knows they need help but can't apply it, at least not initially, as far as hoarding goes. What advice would you have for that family member that sees they need to step in and do something? Well, to that person, I would say approach your hoarder with love and with understanding and recognize that it comes from a place of anxiety. It's not just because they're just digging their heels in right. and they're just refusing to throw things away and, and, and have an unkept home. Um, it comes from a place of anxiety. So if they can first approach that person with compassion, maybe have a family intervention mm -hmm. and say, uh, this is what I see, it's overtaking your house, I want to help, uh, maybe get the other siblings involved, things of that nature and just approach the person with love and say, I will be here for you. Mm -hmm. I will make a plan with you. Um, let's make a plan to, you know, to get rid of some of these things because they have to do it gradually. Right. Because if you do it all at once, it almost like it may send that person to a panic attack. Yes, absolutely. And so you have to kind of have a plan going in. And then part of that plan would be helping um, the hoarder to get some sort of cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes. So they can understand that the basis of, of their disorder is anxiety based. And so to have a therapist that can come alongside the hoarder and the family and teach the hoarder how to um, have self-calming skills 
and being able to, to breathe and let go of one item at a time, maybe even you know, do some exposure therapy, therapy right. where the therapist comes into the home and say, okay, let's throw this away. Okay, take a deep breath. Right. Think, right. Walk, you know, walk them through the, of what it means to to let go and, and visualize and help them to be able to to be able to get to a better place of, of comfort um, in their discomfort. Absolutely, and you know, um, of course, media and television love to sensationalize everything, and you can be flipping channels, and there are shows particularly related to this from an entertainment value. Mm -hmm. But I do remember once going through the channels and and seeing, um, you know, the people swoop in to help the hoarder, and that hoarder is so distressed mm -hmm. and full of anxiety, um, watching all, you know, all of that All their go. life being swept away. Absolutely, and so I find it very interesting that you said gradual. Yes. Uh, as you gradually um, try and help them, and it may not seem like a lot to you, but it's a, it's a great step forward for the hoarder. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, uh, that's fascinating. Um, it's good to think of it in a different light, you know, more like any other kind of disorder. At first I was just thinking, well, they like to keep stuff, you know. No, there's, the <laughs> so much that, there's more. a basis for that. Yeah. But um, I know we talked a little bit about an organized and structured lifestyle, having a plan, you know, having yes. goals. Um, are there other ways to, to help build that healthy family relationship so there won't be as much of a need for things because you've made your family connections better? I mean, do the two correlate? Oh, absolutely, they, they do. If you have a healthy family connection then, and that hoarder won't feel the need to kind of fill that emotional space with all these insignificant things that they have. So repair um, any relationships. Right. Uh, you have to start there, um, whether it be with your parent, if that's the person who is the hoarder, uh, a sibling, and work on repairing that relationship. Um, going to that person and taking responsibility for your part in the conflict, even though you may not have started. Right. Approaching that hoarder with love, um, getting some sort of family counseling can help. And at Ato Life, uh, we're able to, to do that, to help bring families right. uh, together, to be able to in, encourage them to, to support each other through good times and bad. Right. That, that, that is so excellent and how it's all uh, connected. Um, if someone's watching today and, and they realize they have an issue with this and they're hearing you talk and they're going, oh my gosh, that's, that's me. Mm -hmm. Or, or mm -hmm. you know, a family member thinking, what would you say to them those initial stages? We've talked about family resolution. We've talked about slowly, piece by piece, you know, trying. But if somebody like me is just now going, okay, there's a lot more to this than, than I thought, and it's bringing and awakening things in them, what would be the first few basic steps to even address the situation? Well, some of the steps would be, first of all, just being able to mentally just love yourself and accept yourself for who you That's are. That's good. And recognize that your habit or your behavior does not necessarily translate to your heart. So be able to say, okay, this is what I do. I know it's not healthy. It's not an excuse, but it's not a reflection of my heart. So, right. so be able to get away from that, that guilt that we, that we talked about, that hoarders have. Yes. It's important to do. And the next step would be to tell somebody, hey, I have a problem with this. And then you get to choose who that person is. It could be a trusted friend. It could be a family member. Maybe they've been hiding you know, this behind, um, you know, behind their family's back. Just being able to confess that I can't do this on my own. I need some help with that. And then beyond that, there are lots of community um, organizations that you can, that you can um, access. Um, the Mental Health Association of Central Florida is, something, is an organization that you can call. And they offer um, support groups and counseling there, as well as uh, Toll Life Counseling Center. And you can contact us and, and to get some therapy and some help for yourself. To say that I, this problem is bigger than me, literally, it's right. bigger than right. me. So I need some help to be able to, uh, to do this. And then, um, you know, if you're, if you're able to, if, and beyond that, just being able to, to talk to people in your social circle, maybe people at church or in your senior center right. and say, okay, I have a problem with this, you know. Yeah. How, you know, do you know anybody who who struggles with this, and and can you help me? And I, I, as you said too, there there are wonderful resources out there. Whether you're the one suffering with the the issue, or or a loving friend or family member of someone, and so how to how to best um, deal with this. Um, 
I just think, I look at this and I hear you today and it just, it somewhat makes me sad because what you're lacking, I'm making general statement and I'm not a physician, mm -hmm. <laughs> but what you're, it appears what you're lacking in your life you know, that is a basic element that we all need, you know, to, to love, to be loved, to, to be known, to have value, are basically replacing it with objects. Yes. Am I correct in, in that assumption? No, it is, yes. Because, you know, that, that loss of sense of self, that sense of self-worth, self-esteem, uh, self um, for a variety of reasons, right. that things have happened in people's life, is being replaced by these these um, tangible things that are so silly or insignificant, right. and so um, it it makes the person um, feels like calm or secure, like we right. talked about, to have that in their lives, and uh, and ultimately we want to replace those things in the life of a hoarder with quality life, with yes. quality relationships, yes. with a safe place for them to live with family support and all those things that can fill that space that's been lacking in their lives. And, and as someone who also is involved with, you know, family therapy, which would totally be necessary in a situation like this to, to bring true value and true worth to that person instead of the substitution, which are these things, yes. items they're hoarding. Um, do you do you find that that, I'm sure it's difficult, but do you, do you feel as if eventually they reach that place where they have the value and the worth and, and, and the love and the self-confidence, um, or is it something they will always have to keep in check and struggle with? Well, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. Because some people, if they do have a biological basis for anxiety, it, they, it may be a lifelong struggle, okay. you know, that push-pull of sometimes you, you have the intervention, you have the therapy, and, they, and then after a while there's a lull and they start acquiring things again. Yes. But um, if you have somebody that maybe is going, going through situational um, ordeal or where they're replacing things um, because of the death of, of a loss of yes. someone, having quality relationships in their life and being able to fill that with people who love them That's um, can help them recover. Perfect. Lyris, thank you so much. You've been a wealth of information and you've shed some light on some great things and viewers. I hope that you've learned something. It'll motivate you to take a look. And just remember, if we join together, we can spread a little bit of joy in our town. We'll see you again real soon. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.